nature of this revelation verse by verse with special prophecy topics lecture series is Dr. Christine Joy Tan, daughter of Reverend Dr. Paul Lee Tan. Dr. Christine has two earned PhD degrees from Dallas Theological Seminary in Bible Exposition and from the University of North Texas in higher education. Dr. Christine Joy Tan currently serves as president of Grace Christian College, Philippines. She is a Christian educator, author of several journal articles, and editor of books. To date, Dr. Christine has led or co-led some 30 PTPM Bible Land Study Tours to Middle East and Europe under the Paul Lee Tan Prophetic Ministries. Dr. Christine is a Bible prophecy speaker in her own rights. She has lectured on Bible prophecy in several Bible schools in America and Asia. Her PhD dissertation at Dallas Theological Seminary was in the area of Bible prophecy. America's oldest theological journal, Biblioteca Sacra, published Dr. Christine's treatment of Revelation 11's The Two Witnesses in a four-part series. Dr. Christine was personally taught in Bible prophecy by former President Dr. John F. Walvoord of Dallas Theological Seminary. Moreover, her teachers and master thesis PhD dissertation committee at DTS have been among the great names in the area of conservative Bible prophecy. Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost, Dr. Stanley D. Tuzan, Dr. Thomas Constable, Dr. Elliot Johnson, and Dr. Robert P. Leitner. And Dr. Polly Tan mentored her on Bible prophecy since her childhood, youth, and adulthood. She has a broad and solid background in the entire Bible, both Old and New Testament. In addition, she studied advanced Biblical Greek and Hebrew with some theological French and German. She speaks English fluently and is conversant in the Mandarin Chinese and Hokkien languages. Dr. Christine always did her best and with God's help, succeeded in her multivaried specialties, achieving mostly magna cum laude or summa cum laude level recognition in her academic endeavors, and with two doctorates. She gives all glory, honor, and praise to God alone. I have the pleasure and privilege to present to you Dr. Christine Joy Tan. Good day. It is my honor to share with you about the rapture, the blessed hope of Christians. This session on the rapture is divided into five parts. First, we will study the description of the rapture in the Bible. Second, we will examine the differences between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Third, we will describe the biblical supports for the pre-tribulational rapture position. Fourth, we will briefly examine other views of timing of the rapture. Finally, we will see how to prepare for Jesus' return according to the Bible. Let us study how the Bible describes the rapture. The rapture of the church is defined as the carrying away of the church from earth to heaven. The rapture event is described in two major passages in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51-52. Let's first study the 1 Thessalonians 4 passage. Apostle Paul writes to the Thessalonian believers, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The background is that the Thessalonian believers were experiencing some persecution, and as a result, some of the Christians had already died. In the New Testament, 
Sleep is a common figure for death. So them which are asleep denotes Christians who had died. Apostle Paul is telling the Thessalonian believers that it's okay to grieve, but don't grieve like others which have no hope, because in Jesus Christ we have hope. Then he goes on to explain. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So Apostle Paul is saying that Jesus' death and resurrection is the guarantee of the resurrection of Christians as well. The Bible describes the death, burial, and after three days, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a well-attested event in history. E. M. Blaylock, professor of classics at Auckland University writes, the evidence for the life, death, and the resurrection of Christ is better authenticated than most of the facts of ancient history. Professor Thomas Arnold of Oxford University writes, I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort than the great sign which God had given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. Brooke Foss Westcott writes, There is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Christ. Verse 14 again, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So just as certain as we are of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can also be certain that when Jesus Christ comes for living believers, he will bring back the souls of believers who have already died with him. What happens after death according to the Bible? When a person dies, his or her soul goes immediately to heaven or hell. The body is buried in the earth awaiting resurrection. When Jesus Christ returns, the souls of Christians are brought back to earth with Christ. The bodies of Christians are resurrected, and body and soul of Christians are reunited into a glorified resurrected body. Apostle Paul continues in verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So Apostle Paul is saying that if we are still alive when Jesus Christ comes again, we will not go ahead of those Christians who have already passed away. Notice the word we. Apostle Paul himself believed, expected that he would be among those who are still alive when Jesus Christ comes again. This is among the supports for the biblical doctrine of imminency, which we'll, we will later explain. Then in verses 16 and 17, Apostle Paul describes what will happen in the rapture event. First, the return of Jesus Christ. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Where is Jesus Christ now? According to the Bible, Jesus Christ is now in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Romans 8.34 Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, the rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So Jesus Christ at the right hand of God is praying for us believers. Hebrews 1.3 Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. 
So Jesus Christ will leave his position at the right hand of God the Father in heaven and descend to earth in the clouds. And Apostle Paul emphasizes it's the Lord himself, Jesus himself will come. Imagine he loves us so much that he will not just send an angel or issue a command. He will come and welcome Christians and bring, bring us to heaven to be with him. This is an artist's depiction of Jesus Christ coming to the clouds at the rapture event. Second, the resurrection of Christians who have passed away. First Thessalonians 4.16 continues, In the dead in Christ shall rise first. In Christ refers to believers of this dispensation, church age saints, starting from the day of Pentecost all the way until the rapture. Someday at the rapture, Christians who have already passed away will be resurrected. Some may ask, what about the bodies of believers who were cremated, or they were lost at sea, or they were in an airplane crash? We believe that the God who created the universe out of nothing with a word, is fully able to reassemble the decayed bodies of all his saints in a moment of time. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Notice that God will first resurrect Christians who have passed away before transforming Christians who are still alive. Our God delights in doing first what is seemingly harder. In this rapture postcard, the artist depicts believers who have already passed away being resurrected when Jesus Christ comes at the rapture. Third, the rapture of living Christians. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. If we are still alive when Jesus Christ comes for us at the rapture, then we will be caught up to the clouds. And 1 Corinthians 15 explains that we will have glorified bodies without having to die. At the rapture, Jesus Christ will come to the clouds. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then living Christians will be caught up. They will be transformed to have glorified bodies. Number four, reunion with Jesus Christ and with fellow Christians. Verse 17 continues, And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Apostle Paul here emphasizes the person with whom we will be, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus will take believers to a place that he is currently preparing for us. In John chapter 14, the context is the upper room where Jesus is talking to his disciples just before his betrayal and crucifixion. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Finally, verse 18, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. The truth, the hope of the rapture, is intended for the comfort, encouragement, reassurance of Christians. In 1 Corinthians 15, Apostle Paul also describes the rapture. Behold, I show you a mystery. The word mystery is from the Greek word mysterion, used 27 times in the New Testament. The New Testament usage does not give the idea of something mysterious or baffling, but something unheard of and unrevealed. The rapture is a brand new New Testament truth. The rapture of the church was a mystery, 
not known in the Old Testament, but now revealed. 1 Corinthians 15 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. At the rapture event, living Christians would get glorified bodies without having to die. Verse 52 describes how fast this will be. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The entire procedure will be instantaneous, not gradual. The word for moment is the word from which the word Adam comes. When the Adam was discovered, it was thought to be indivisible. Therefore, it was named Adam. Even though subsequently the Adam was split, the word retains its meaning of indivisible. The resurrection of the dead and the translation of the living will occur in an indivisible instant of time. The subsequent verses describe the exchanging of the temporal and imperfect for the eternal and perfect. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul concludes in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So the certainty about the future, especially regarding the resurrection, should motivate us to faithful service as our labor in the Lord is not futile. So again at the rapture, Jesus Christ will come from heaven to the clouds. Christians who have already passed away will be resurrected. Then Christians who are still alive when Jesus Christ comes again will be caught up to the clouds and receive glorified bodies without having to die. In summary, the rapture of the church is the carrying away of the church from earth to heaven. Major scripture are 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. The sequence is first the return of Jesus Christ, then the resurrection of Christians who have passed away, then the rapture of living Christians, then there is a reunion of Jesus Christ with fellow Christians. All this will happen in a moment. We have studied the description of the rapture in the Bible. Now let's see the difference between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. The rapture will occur before the seven-year tribulation. Major scripture are 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. So the rapture will occur before the seven-year tribulation. The second coming of Christ will occur at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Major scripture is Revelation chapter 19. So the second coming of Christ will occur at the end of the seven-year tribulation. At the rapture, Jesus will come for the church. At the second coming, Jesus Christ will come with the church. At the rapture, Jesus Christ will come in the air in the clouds. At the second coming, Jesus Christ will come to the earth. The Bible says his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. The rapture has no signs. The second coming is full of signs. 
The rapture is the blessed hope of Christians. The second coming is a time of judgment. The rapture event will occur like a thief, unexpectedly. At the second coming, every eye will see him, Jesus Christ. The rapture is for the church. The second coming is for Jews and Gentiles. The rapture, the example is Lot. Before God could bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, he had to take Lot and his family out of the city. The second coming, the example is Noah. Noah and his family were preserved through the flood in the ark. The rapture is a time of joy and blessing. At the second coming, the earth shall mourn. We have studied what the Bible describes about the rapture. We have looked at the differences between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Now let us examine the biblical supports for the pre-tribulational rapture position. In this section, we will examine the biblical support for the pre-tribulational rapture, why we believe the rapture occurs before the seven-year tribulation. Pre-tribulationism teaches that the rapture of the church, both dead and living saints, will occur before the seven-year tribulation period, that is, before the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel 9, 24-27. So pre-tribulationism holds that the rapture of the church will occur before the seven-year tribulation. Let's examine some biblical support for the pre-tribulational rapture, why we believe the rapture occurs before the seven-year tribulation. First, Revelation 3.10 and other scripture. In Revelation 3.10, Jesus said, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Pre-tribulationists understand this verse to mean that Christians will be kept from the hour of temptation from the seven-year tribulation, not that Christians will go through the hour of temptation and be protected in the midst of it. Pre-tribulationist understanding of the Greek preposition et translated from is supported by usage of this Greek word in other non-rapture contexts of external protection external preservation. Moreover, Revelation 3.10 guarantees Christians being kept from the time period of the tribulation, not just the trials of the tribulation. Also, Revelation 3.10 specifies that the trials will be worldwide. This promise was made to all the churches, not just the church in first century Philadelphia. Here again is Christ's promise to his church. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Jesus is saying, there is coming a period of testing on the whole world. And Christians will be kept from that time of testing. We believe this is through the rapture, which will occur before the time of testing, before the seven-year tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9-10 
for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Second, the New Testament doctrine of imminency. The idea of imminency may be encapsulated in the phrase, Jesus is coming, maybe today. Let's study further. What exactly is the imminent coming of Jesus Christ and how should it affect our lives? The imminent coming of Christ means his next coming is always hanging overhead, constantly ready to befall or overtake us, always close at hand in the sense that it could happen at any moment. Other things may happen before his coming, but nothing else must happen. Since we do not know exactly when he will come, we cannot count on a fixed amount of time transpiring before his arrival. Therefore, we should always be ready for him at any moment. Let's look at some scripture which support the New Testament doctrine of imminency. 1 Corinthians 16.22 If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Maranatha means our Lord come. It is a petition. Philippians 4.5 Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So there's the idea of expectancy, of anticipation. James 5 Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. There's the anticipation that Jesus could come at any moment. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 This is at the end of the passage on the rapture. Apostle Paul writes, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. So Jesus coming for Christians at the rapture is a comforting thought, but there is no comfort if Christians have to go through any part of the seven-year tribulation. 1 John 2.28 And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Reynolds Showers explains what this verse means. Christ's imminent return should make a difference in the way we live. We should live holy, godly lives every moment of every day, because in the very next moment, Christ could step through the doors of heaven and confront us face to face. The book Maranatha, Our Lord Come, by Reynolds Showers is perhaps the most extensive defense of the imminent hope. Third, removal of the restrainer, 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 to 8. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 to 8. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So this refers to the removal of the restrainer before the day of the Lord. 
Currently, although there is sin and evil in the world, there is not the full manifestation of sin and evil. There is something that is restraining evil in the world. And 2 Thessalonians 2 tells us that when the restrainer is taken out of the way, the wicked one, Antichrist, will be revealed. Many Bible scholars believe that the restrainer, in order to restrain Satan, evil in the world, is a member of the Godhead. There is biblical support that the restrainer is God the Holy Spirit. According to the Bible, the Holy Spirit indwells Christians permanently, and Christians are also to serve as salt and light in this world. At the rapture, Christians who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit are caught up to heaven. The Holy Spirit is still present in the world but no longer actively restraining evil. In fact, all hell breaks loose during the tribulation. The entire seven years of tribulation is the outpouring of God's wrath on mankind. The seven-year tribulation, also known as the 70th week of Daniel chapter 9, is a time of God's outpouring of wrath on the earth. The restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2 is God the Holy Spirit who indwells Christians. After Christians are raptured to heaven, the Holy Spirit is no longer actively restraining evil in the world. Then comes God's judgments on earth during the seven-year tribulation, during which the wicked one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. Another support for the pre-tribulational rapture is the contrast between two comings of Jesus Christ. There are many passages about Jesus Christ's coming that seem contradictory if the rapture and second coming are lumped together. For example, how can Jesus come secretly and yet openly? How can his coming be the blessed hope and yet a time of judgment? It is best to distinguish between the rapture, which occurs before the seven-year tribulation, from the second coming of Christ, which will occur at the end of the seven-year tribulation. The rapture of the church before the seven-year tribulation, the second coming of Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Another support for the pre-tribulational rapture position is the absence of the word church in Revelation chapter 6 to 18. In Revelation chapters 1 to 3, the word church in Greek, ekklesia, is mentioned 19 times. However, in Revelation chapter 6 to 18, which describes the tribulation in detail, the word church, ekklesia, is absent. In Revelation chapter 6 to 18, which describes the seven year tribulation, the word church, ecclesia, is absent. This is an argument from silence, but it is a loud silence, and supports the view that during the tribulation, the church is no longer on earth, but already raptured into heaven. An important foundational support for the pre-tribulational rapture position is the consistent literal or normal interpretation of the Bible. What is the literal or normal interpretation of the Bible? In his groundbreaking book, The Interpretation of Prophecy, Dr. Polly Tan explains, 
The literal method of interpreting God's word is based on the assumption that the words of Scripture can be trusted. It assumes that since God intends his revelation to be understood, divine revelation must be written based on regular rules of human communications. To understand a speaker or writer, one must assume that the speaker or writer is using words normally and without multiple meanings. This is what the literal method of interpretation assumes of God in scriptural revelation. It believes the Bible to be revelation, not riddle. A consistent literal or normal interpretation of scripture leads to results in a distinction between Israel and the church. God's plan for Israel is distinguished from God's plan for the church. Another support for the pre-tribulational rapture position is an understanding of the nature of the tribulation. In order to fully understand the background of the seven-year tribulation, we must look at Daniel chapter 9. In chapter 9, God gave to the prophet Daniel an amazing prophecy which relates to Israel called the 77s prophecy. In this significant prophecy, which is too involved to detail here, God tells Daniel about 70 units of seven years which relate to the future of Israel. The 69th seven concluded when Jesus Christ was presented to Israel at the triumphal entry. Then the prophetic stopwatch for Israel stopped. The 70th seven, the final unit of seven years, has not yet occurred. Now God is specially dealing with the church and has been doing so for the past more than 2,000 years. But someday, after the rapture of the church, God will again focus on Israel. The 70th seven of Daniel chapter nine prophecy, the final unit of seven years will occur, which is the same as the seven year tribulation period described in Revelation chapters 6 to 18. At the beginning of the Daniel 9 prophecy, God's angel tells Daniel, 70 weeks, in the original Hebrew, the word is Shavua, literally seven, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Who is Daniel's people? The Israelites, Israel. What is the holy city? Jerusalem. So the Daniel 9 prophecy relates to Israel and Jerusalem, not to the church. The identification of thy people with Israel in thy holy city with Jerusalem is supported by at least two considerations, the prophecy itself and the context. First, the prophecy itself. Daniel 9, 24 to 27, specifically refers to the city of Jerusalem and to the temple. Second, the context. This prophecy, given by God through his angel, was an answer to Daniel's prayer, which related to the Jews, as seen in Daniel 9, 2 to 19. The respected scholar, Dr. John F. Walverd, wrote, To make this equivalent to the church composed of both Jews and Gentiles is to read into the passage something foreign to the whole thinking of Daniel. Thus, the Daniel 9 prophecy, the 70 units of seven years, relates to Israel, not to the church. Daniel 9 prophecy's final 70th unit of seven years is the same as the seven-year tribulation 
described in Revelation chapter 6 to 18. This relates to Israel, not to the church. This is another reason why we believe the church will be raptured before any part of the seven-year tribulation starts. In Matthew 24, 21, Jesus refers to the tribulation period. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Another support for the pre-tribulational rapture is an understanding of the nature of the church, according to the Bible. First, Scripture distinguishes between Israel and the church and God's programs for each. Second, the mystery nature of the church. Biblically, mystery describes something unknown, unrevealed in the past, but at a given point in time is revealed. See Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 26. The church is a mystery unrevealed in the Old Testament. Let's study the New Testament, Ephesians 3, 1 to 5. In Ephesians 3, Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. This is the mystery, unrevealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament, that a new body is to be formed, composed of both Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles to be fellow heirs, and on the same level as Jews. This is the church. The logic is thus. Israel was revealed in the Old Testament. The church is distinct from Israel. The church is a mystery unrevealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament. Since the Old Testament describes the seven-year tribulation in Daniel 9.27, the church is not in the seven-year tribulation. Let's briefly mention some other biblical supports for the pre-tribulational rapture position. First, Apostle Paul's use of the Greek peri day, not simply day, in 1 Thessalonians 5.1 indicates contrasting subjects between 1 Thessalonians 4.13-18 and 1 Thessalonians 5.1-11. Second, the pre-tribulational rapture position explains the presence of millennial inhabitants with their mortal bodies. Third, the pre-tribulational rapture position allows for intervening events which seem to require time between the rapture and Christ's second coming to earth. For example, the Bema or judgment seat of Christ. For further and in-depth studies, of biblical supports for the pre-tribulational rapture position, I commend to you Gerald Stanton's classic work, Kept from the Hour, Biblical Evidence for the Pre-Tribulational Return of Christ. Again, pre-tribulationism teaches that the rapture of the church, both dead and living saints, will occur before the seven-year tribulation period that is, before the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel 9, 24-27. We have briefly gone over some biblical supports for the pre-tribulational rapture position, why we believe the rapture occurs before the seven-year tribulation. The fourth major part of the session on the rapture relates to other views of timing. Let's briefly examine other views 
on the timing of the rapture. There are four general views on the timing of the rapture. Pre-tribulationism, partial rapture, mid-tribulationism, post-tribulationism. Pre-tribulationism holds that the rapture of the church will occur before the seven-year tribulation. We believe that the biblical evidence best supports the position of pre-tribulationism. Another position is partial rapture. Partial rapture holds that only Christians who are watching and waiting for Christ's return will be raptured. The rest will go through the tribulation. Partial rapturists teach that there will be several times rapture and resurrection of overcomers. Let's briefly examine some problems with the partial rapture position. Number one, according to partial rapture proponents, their position keeps believers watching and preparing for Christ's return. However, the biblical basis for watching is not fear, but love for Jesus Christ and his commands. Second, partial rapture proponents say that in Philippians 3, 10 11, Apostle Paul was seemingly unsure of his own rapture experience, if by any means. However, the word resurrection used in Philippians 3 means better resurrection. Paul was aiming to get top honor in that heavenly graduation day. Third, according to partial rapture proponents, in the watch passages in the gospel, Jesus Christ exhorts his disciples to watch and be ready with the alternative of darkness and gnashing of teeth. However, these passages refer to the second coming of Christ, not the rapture. The partial rapture position confuses Bible passages on the rapture and second coming, which is a major difficulty. Four, according to partial rapture proponents, it is unfair for all Christians dedicated and lukewarm to be raptured together. However, the rapture is a vehicle to bring us to the air. The judgment seat of Christ will follow in the air, 2 Corinthians 5.10, where some will appear empty-handed, 1 Corinthians 3.15. Moreover, the rapture is not a reward for godly living. Godly living will be rewarded with crowns, not rapture. See 2 Timothy 4.8 and other passages on crowns. Number 5. Another problem of the partial rapture position is tribulation is never set forth as the means of disciplining church saints. The tribulation period is never spoken of as a time of chastening for the church or part of the church. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, according to Jeremiah 37. Sixth, another problem with the partial rapture position is that this position divides the unity of the body of Christ, the church. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 plainly states that all will be changed, not some. The baptism of the Holy Spirit does place all believers in the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Thus all will experience the promise of the rapture. 7. Another problem with the partial rapture position is that there is no imminent hope for all believers. Only ones who have it are the spiritual ones. Another view of the timing of the rapture is mid-tribulationism. Mid-tribulationism holds that the church will be raptured at the middle of the tribulation. This is a diagram of the mid-tribulationism position. Let's examine some problems with mid-tribulationism. Mid-tribulationists equate the seven-trumpet judgment of Revelation 11 
with the last trump of First Corinthians fifteen, fifty one and fifty two. However, the last trumpet in First Corinthians fifteen is not the last trumpet that ever blows. Why associate together the trumpets of Revelation eleven and First Corinthians fifteen? This is a somewhat simplistic argument that assumes that all blowing of trumpets must indicate the same kind of event. The seventh trumpet of Revelation is a trumpet of judgment, whereas the trumpet in 1 Corinthians is one of resurrection and deliverance. Second, mid-tribulationists say that the two witnesses of Revelation 11 symbolize the church, which is raptured at the middle of the tribulation. However, a hermeneutical rule says that when a symbol is explained and described in great detail, it is not a symbol. Revelation 11 describes the two witnesses in great detail, making it not a symbol. Third, mid-tribulationists hold that the beginning of sorrows of Matthew 24, 8 is to be placed with the seven seals and seven trumpets of Revelation chapter 6 to 11. Thus, the first half of the tribulation is not as severe and the church may be allowed to go through it. However, by Revelation chapter 9, we see one half of the world's inhabitants are already killed if we combine Revelation 6, 8 with Revelation 9, 15. If that is not the tribulation, then what is? A fourth problem with mid-tribulationism is thus. Mid-tribulationists say that during the first half of the tribulation, there will be trials and judgments, but these are due to the wrath of men. However, the judgments of the second half of the tribulation come from the wrath of God. However, Revelation 6 describes the seal judgments. Revelation 6, 16-17 states that the wrath of the Lamb has come. This indicates that God's wrath will begin before the sixth seal is opened. To fit the mid-tribulation scene, we would have to place the beginning seal's judgment in the second half of the tribulation. Another view on the timing of the rapture is post-tribulationism. Post-tribulationism holds that the rapture and second coming are facets of one event occurring at the end of the tribulation when Christ returns. Thus, in the post-tribulational framework, the church will be on earth during the tribulation to experience the tribulational events. This is a diagram of the post-tribulational view of prophecy. What are some problems with post-tribulationism? First, in the post-tribulationism, you're able to calculate the approximate time of Christ's second coming. Second, it cannot solve the problem of the millennial people. Third, more than 3,000 verses on Second Coming are contradictory. Fourth, you must spiritualize some tribulational passages. Fifth, the role of Israel is greatly minimized, sometimes absorbed into the church. Sixth, post-tribulationists say that the New Testament writers use several words to describe Christ's coming. If the rapture and second coming are different events separated by seven years, why didn't they reserve words for each event instead of seeming to use them interchangeably? Answer: The vocabulary used in the New Testament alone does not seem to prove either pre- or post-tribulationism. 7. Post-tribulationists say that the occurrence of the word saints in Revelation 13.7, 13.10, 16.6, 17.6, and 18.24 
shows that the church is on the earth during the tribulation? Answer. Does the word saints refer to church age saints? Actually, the appearance of the word saints in Revelation chapters 4 to 18 does not prove anything until you know what saints they are. There were saints, godly ones, in the Old Testament, Psalm 16, 3. There are saints today, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. There will be saints in the tribulation years, Revelation 13, 7, and others. The question is, are the saints of this church age distinct from saints of the tribulation period? Pre-tribulationism would say yes. Post-tribulationism would say no. The uses of the word will not answer the question. We believe that the biblical evidence best supports pre-tribulationism, that the rapture of the church will occur before the seven-year tribulation, and the second coming of Christ will occur at the end of the seven-year tribulation. The rapture of the church before the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, the second coming of Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation. The final section of the session on the rapture is how to prepare for Jesus' return according to the Bible. How to personally prepare for Jesus' return. Can we know the time of Christ's return? By looking at signs of the Great Tribulation, one can know the times and seasons, 1 Thessalonians 5.1. These include wars, pestilences, economic systems, moral decay, religious unity, Satanism, Middle East, United Europe, world government, Antichrist, etc. The Bible describes some signs of the end times. Can we know the time of Jesus' return? No, the rapture event has no prior signs. It would be totally unexpected. Christ forbade time setting in Matthew 24. The early church considered it imminent. They greeted each other with Maranatha, 1 Corinthians 16.22, which means our Lord come. The rapture of the church has no signs preceding it. Are you ready for eternity? If something were to happen to you, would you know if you would spend eternity in heaven or in hell? This is the Gospel Bridge. On one side is sinful man. On the other side is holy God. And the only way to God the Father is through Jesus Christ. All of the good works we do, the education we have, the philosophy, the religions we believe in, the science we believe in, all these will not get us to heaven. The only way is by trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your personal Savior from sin. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you want to accept God's free gift of eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ, you may pray this prayer of salvation in your heart. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Please come into my heart and forgive my sins. I now believe in Jesus Christ and trust in Him alone as my personal Savior. Thank you, dear God, for giving me eternal life and abundant life in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed, 
trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior from sin, then you are saved. If you are a Christian already, how then shall we live in light of Jesus' return? We have been emphasizing the fact that our remaining time could be short and the Lord is coming soon. This does not mean that we should stop work, shorten all long-range plans, and wait atop mountains to await Christ's return. On the other hand, we should also not fill our lives with non-essentials. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. The proper lifestyle in the watch for the Lord is to continue doing what we have been doing, but do it all as to the Lord. Fulfill every area of life's endeavors and service for the Lord. Share the good news of salvation with others. Have fellowship with fellow believers and maintain a healthy Christian life. At His coming, Christ wants to find us busy at work for Him, and not idly waiting for Him. Colossians 3, 23-24 And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. How then shall we live? Titus 2 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. How shall we then live? According to the Bible, we should have these character traits. Watchful, faithful, soberly, purity, repentant, moderate, meekness, patient, sincerity, godliness, victoriously, courageously, testimony, sanctification, abide in Christ, suffer for Christ, not worldly, brotherly love, love his appearance, not judging, Celebrate the Lord's Supper. The final verse of the book of Revelation is Revelation 22.20. 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. There is a beautiful song called Maybe Today that I'd like to share with you. My Lord will come, it may be soon. It could be morning, night, or noon. Till then I'll watch and work and pray. When He comes, I'll go home there to stay. Maybe today. My Lord will come for me. Maybe today my Savior I shall see. Maybe today from sin I shall be free. Jesus will come and I will go home 
it may be today. My Lord will come, I know not when, but this is sure, He'll come again. With eager eyes I look for Him, in His presence new joy will begin. We'll sing His praise forevermore. When we have entered heaven's door, redeemed from all our sin and strife, there will no perfect love, endless life. Maybe today my Lord will come for me. Maybe today my Savior I shall see. Maybe today from sin I shall be free. Jesus will come and I will go home. It may be today. For further studies, may I recommend these excellent resources on Bible prophecy. Thanks very much for listening. Maranatha, may God bless you as you live for Him.